to call up Indians to heal. Well, Tuxilla, as it was sometime called, <coughs> to heal, where we spent ten exciting years of our life by living our 52 years in Central America. Never a dull moment, as the saying is. Yes, that was Trujillo. Trujillo. The very thought of that place brings to mind many very pleasant memories. And yet, at the same time, some not so pleasant. <coughs> Trujillo, where the bullets from a soldier's rifle came down on the very spot where our two girls and some of their companions were playing a moment before. Trujillo, where I wrestled with a man, twice my weight, to keep him from killing his daughter who had disgraced him. While my wife, Ron, got to his bed, pulled up the mattress, and got the revolver out in time, and ran away with it so that he could not use it. Yes, through heel that place that we never can forget. <coughs> and thank the Lord, much work was done for eternity in that same place. <coughs> yes, to heal. That was the place where we were much thought of. But before that, we had to prove ourselves. Now, there's one thing about a pioneer missionary in a place where no other missionaries have been. He must prove himself. He must prove to the people that he is not a rascal. As far as they would, would know, he might be a thief. He might be the worst man of living. How would they know? They have to have experience. So therefore the missionary must be one who is willing and able to take a very humble place at times. He must prove to those people his worth. How else could they expect to put their faith and confidence in what he says? As one man explained to me once, we have been bitten before, and we don't want to be deceived again. That was a wise man. But strange to say, there are some even Christians in the homelands who don't understand that. They think because they are Christians, they live a good life, that their conduct should not be in any way looked into. They never do much work in the countries we have been, if that's so. So that's the first thing to be done. Now in the coming day, I'm sure of one thing. My wife will have a rich reward as far as that is concerned. What's a wife for? A help me. A help me, that's it. But sometimes the helpmeet can even do more than the man at certain things. And I can tell you one thing. The poor woman of today are off the track altogether. 
They don't understand poor things. That's it. And there seems to be no one who can guide them and help them. Well, to make a longer story a little bit shorter, if it is at all possible, my wife started in. And she walked for six miles for weeks to attend to two poor girls dying with consumption. Nothing could be done for them. Remember, there were no doctors there, no nurses, no help. They were doomed. The only thing that could be done was to help them with a little nourishing food, some medicine, milk, and such things. So therefore, my wife walked those six miles for weeks in the early morning about five after she fed the little babe then came back in time again at noon to go on with her housework but that's what attracted the attention of the people that's what opened their eyes that's what proved to them that it was real they would not be deceived but of course, that didn't go down well with some folk, especially the Roman Catholic priest. So he gave quite a sermon one Sunday morning on a very dangerous snake that had come into the community. That was my wife. Yes, she was a terrible one. She was going to destroy the whole people. And he got on to such an extent that the principal Carib Indians in Cristales, the twin city you might call it, along with Trujillo, that's where their headquarters were. And they are a wonderful people. The head men, all dressed up in their best. He came up, demanded an interview with the priest. They got it. And they told him plainly, if ever he would speak in such a way that he had that morning, what they were going to do. And they put it down in a manner very plain indeed. The result was, there was no more trouble. <coughs> But as my wife made her way to that village, she noticed behind her a Carib man. In the front of her, a Carib man. What were they doing? They were taking care of her. Why, they told the priest, here is a lady that has come amongst us. And she's helping the poor. She's taken an interest in the sick. She's doing all to help them. And do you know what? She won't even take one cent for what she's doing. Ah, that got them. Yes, the opposition to the gospel was overcome as far as the Carib Indians were concerned. They received us joyfully. And the news spread far and wide so that when I entered one of those Carib Indian villages, if you listened attentively, you could hear <coughs> this is Donianetti's husband. And that seemed to be the key word. That was the letter of commendation, if you like to put it in that way. That then were all right. We weren't deceivers. We weren't rascals. We weren't thieves. We weren't there to take their money away from them. And the Lord used his word amongst those dear people. We'll tell you about that at another time. However, 
I think we'll go on and speak a little about the Arabs. The Arabs, of course, were from Palestine, and they had quite an idea of what had happened. <coughs> Some of them had gone to a Christian school there, while the British had possession or taken care of that land. But then laws changed and they had to get out. So many of them came over to Central America. They were the business people, had the big stores, and were those traders. However, as to the gospel, they didn't seem to know much about that. So there was a little opposition, and sometimes going through the villages, meeting with some of those people, well, they didn't give us a hearty welcome. But the Lord came in and opened up the way to amongst them. There was two or three families living in Trujillo. One of them, by the name of Dona Florinda, you've heard about her before, she had started to attend the meetings. But she couldn't understand very well. There was too much sin brought into the <laughs> speaking. There is too much punishment about sin. That was something that people don't like to hear about. But it's something that's very necessary to speak about, first of all. And then lead them to the one who can save them from the punishment of sin. This dear lady, and some of her daughters attended the meetings. Sometimes she said she wasn't coming back. She didn't understand. Don Juan would read us uh, something from this book, and very quickly he would turn over to another book. She couldn't understand that. Well, however, as time went on, some of her family developed, developed a disease, typhoid fever. Three or four of them went down with typhoid fever. Now, there was no doctor in that city. There was no nurse there. There were very few who knew anything about medicine. Of course they had the Sukhis, they had the witch doctors, they had others. However, when my wife knew that Dona Florinda was in trouble, she went down and visited her. She found out she had no help the help that she had ran away. They were afraid of that disease. She had no one to help her. She had a big store. She had quite a family. Even none of the cooks, where were they? So my wife volunteered to help. How can that be, Dona Florinda said? This is a very dangerous disease, very contagious. I don't think that you should do what you want to do. Never mind that, my wife said. That's quite all right. The Lord will give the protection. So right enough, she stayed down there, and I can't tell you how many days, but she stayed until they were all out of danger. Now that's what opened up the way for the gospel. 
amongst those dear people, the Arabs. Pretty soon, all of that large family professed to be saved and have been going on for all these years, being a wonderful help in the work. The news of that went very far away, and at times I met with it. I had occasion to do some business in San Pedro Zula in one of the big stores. And when it came to the paying of the bill, they said they were giving me 10, 15 percent off the bill. We know what you did to our people in Trujillo. So in that way, we had advantages too. But of course, we weren't looking for that. We were looking for the salvation of souls. And we saw many of those dear people come to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ too. One Sunday afternoon, sitting there, waiting the time for the meeting, a car drove up. This is afterwards, years afterwards, when they got roads in. The car stopped, a gentleman and his wife got out. They were big business people in San Pedro Zula. He had a request to make. What was it? Would I please pray for them? They were in difficulties, financially. They might lose about half a million dollars. The most of those people were millionaires in business. In many ways, they made their money. But they were in difficulties. Would we pray for them? Yes, why not? Sure. So we prayed for them, and away they went. Soon after that, we got a message that everything had been fixed up. They didn't lose a half million after all. And we do believe that that dear lady, too, is on her way to heaven. Not only her, but her sister. So in that way, the Lord opened up the way for a work amongst those dear people. Trujillo, yes, Trujillo. As well as the various tribes of Indians and the Arabs who live in Honduras, there are the Ladinos. They are the mixture of the Spaniard who came over with Columbus and the native Indian. But in Trujillo, there lives a special kind of people. They are the elite of the country. Are not they the ones that came along with Columbus? Did they not bring the hundreds of uh, priests, Roman Catholic priests, to the country? Did they not have a great responsibility in those days? And to this day, we find that kind of people there. They look down upon many of the others. They are the higher class. <coughs> they are society. Now it was this these kind of people that seem to hinder the gospel even more than the Roman Catholic priests. Yes, they tried all means, talking and threatening, and I don't know what they were all going to do. If my wife would go near their place, they always had a ke boiling kettle of water ready to throw down on her. 
And in many ways, the cause much inconvenience. Their children were encouraged to spit upon our children. In fact, they did so. Now that's very hard for a mother to, to, to take. And sometimes it was all I could do to keep my wife from going out and making a scene. But we knew it was safer and better to leave this in the hands of God. So God took care of it in a very remarkable way. Of course, the fame of my wife had been all over the place by this time, having a little idea of how to treat people in illness. And as we have also brought before you the success that God gave her in that line. Now what do you think should happen? One day, a father came to our door. He belonged to these kind of people. He asked me, do you think that your wife would have the time to leave the wonderful work that she is doing and come to our house to see this child who is very ill. Now it appeared that this little boy, about two or three years of age, had developed some kind of a lump on his head. No doctors in Trujillo, as we have said, no nurses. So they took him a long way to find a doctor. In fact, they had two or three doctors, but of no avail. That lump seemed to grow. It was inflamed, very angry looking. And the poor little fellow was in pain. And they were at their wit's end. They did not know what to do. But as a last remedy, they thought that it would be better to leave many of their beliefs behind and consult my wife. Yes, she would go. So she went. She looked at this lump, and she looked at it, and she looked at it again. And she lifted up her thoughts and prayer to God to give the needed guidance, help, and wisdom. So she started in. Now, I can't tell you all she did. Poultices, hot water, bathing it, being very careful and squeezing it. She kept that up. Even in the night time, she would go back, do the same thing over for several days. And then one day, like a boy, it burst open. And what do you think came out? Hundreds, now I'm saying hundreds, of little worms. Those little worms were eating into the flesh. Not only to the flesh, but down into the brain. So carefully, she began to pick those worms out, one after one, 
the little pair of tweezers. To make a longer story short, her work was finished. She got them all out. She used some kind of disinfectant. She kept going back to that house until that little fellow was all right again. After that, there was a change. The persecution stopped. And why? Sad to say, we never did see very much done to those people. They were too rich in everything. <coughs> but Trujillo, yes, Trujillo, where my wife was tried and tested to almost the breaking point. That, of course, occurs at times in nearly every missionary's experience. The barrel of meal had been going down for some time, and uh, for some reason uh, there was nothing put back into it. So it was getting pretty low. And the flagon of oil, too, was going down. And on this particular day, I was going out to visit an Englishman. And he lived out along the line, and he had the banana farm. And as I said goodbye to Nettie about five in the morning, to start off, I said, I am going to a place where I know there'll be plenty to eat. But I'm afraid you're not going to have much. Well, that's all right, she said. We'll fix up somehow. Now, at that time, we had a young man, his wife and two children, living with us, temporarily. And uh, there they were, too. So I went on my trip until it was time, well, to eat. And when uh, Nettie got to the barrel, it was lower than she had thought. In fact, she couldn't scrape up anything out of it. And as to the oil, it was down to the last two drops. Well, what to do? What to do? Well, she got angry. Angry with the Lord. And she fought it out with him, so she said afterwards. Didn't you tell us that we would come down here and you would look after us? Didn't we understand that all we had got to do was to spread the good news of salvation and everything would be taken care of? Well, where is that care now? Here there's nothing in the house. Here there's these two children and their own little babe. What about them? Are they going to starve? There must be something wrong. What is it? And uh, she got, well, quite excited about it, naturally. And uh, while she was uh, writing a letter to her father, she thought that she would, yes, just tell him what was happening. But no. Oh, no. No, no. I wasn't trusting the Lord. Nothing like that. So she did not do it. However, very soon there was a knock on the door. Now, it was the mailboy. Well, that was very strange. It wasn't mail day. The mail wasn't supposed to come in that day. But however, there was the mailboy, and he held out a letter, and he said, Donionetti, is this yours? And she looked at it, and she said, yes, it is. That's what I said, he said. Now, that letter 
had been going about all over Honduras for two weeks. And there was the mark of the American consuls on it. There was the mark of the British consul on it. There was the mark of the United Fruit Company on it. There was the government of Honduras' mark on it. And it had been going all around. So, well, it was hers, so he gave it to her, and he said, yes, I knew it was yours. So she opened the letter, and out came $10. Mm -hmm. Now, when she saw that $10, she just rushed off to have it changed. No bank in the place, but some of the merchants were very glad to have dollars. So very soon she got it changed into Lempiris. An officer on before they meet market would close. You see, there's no refrigeration down in that part then. And the meat market just closed as soon as the, the uh, beef was sold. And they just killed enough for the day and no more. So she ran to see if there was any meat left, and sure enough, there the was. She ran and got some vegetables, and back she came, and pretty soon there was a big pot of soup on. And very soon there she was dishing it out to that dear sister and her two children and her little girl. And when she got it dished out, then she started to dish out her own, but she couldn't. She couldn't. And she had to excuse herself and go to the bedroom, get down on her knees, and par ask pardon from the Lord, forever doubting him and his power to supply that which was needed. So there it was. And I might say that the Englishman got saved, too. Well, there was something, something that was bright. And uh, without sacrifice, you know, at times there's nothing to do. But thank the Lord for his provision all the way along. Yes, God provides. If he calls, if he sends, then he M-U-S-T provide that's faith and he provides sometimes in different ways and sometimes in remarkable ways and sometimes he's providing and you don't know he's providing now there was one thing that troubled me before even going to the mission field I never would be able to look after my family the way others look after them. What about the children? I never would be able to give them the education that others give them. What about the time when it comes to them to be married? Where will the money come from? That's what worried me more than anything else. But however, we just had to trust the Lord. Now, Nettie's father was a very remarkable man, a very good man, and a man full of wisdom. Now, he began to write and inquire about conditions. He asked about the place in which we were living. He asked about a housing uh, problem. He asked about prices. He asked about were there no houses for sale. And of course, he tried to answer those questions as much as possible. And then eventually, he wrote a letter and said he was sending a check to buy a certain house. 
The only thing, it must be for the children, not for us. And that's what he did. So that house was for them. It was not for me, nor my wife, nor even for the work. It was for the children. Well, that was way back in the 30s. But you see, he was looking away, back, away forward to the 50s. And that was rather much for me. But however, that's how it was. The house was bought in their name. Yes, and uh, we had to fix it up a little. It was one of the old ones. Walls 18, 24 inches thick. Good solid house. Needed a little repairs, of course. But there was uh, an addition to the house. It could suit two families. So we moved into it and we rented the house from our children. And that was funny. What was the effect? Well, we might as well be giving them the money as some stranger. So part of the house was divided and we were able to rent it. The rent from that paid for the repairs of the main house. And then afterwards, that went in also to the account of the children. So when it came time for them to be educated, well, we never will forget our oldest girl. Taking her to Gusigalpa, putting her in that two-engine plane, no facilities for altitude, and that's what troubled her on the way that her ears gave her trouble. She was two days in the way, and th everyone thought she was lost. She should have been there long before. Something went wrong with the plane, had to stay over in Mexico, but the Lord looked after her there. Then went on to Los Angeles where some friends met her. Arrangements were made, and she went into high school. She went right into high school and went right out of it. And then went right into the university and went right out of that too with flying colors. Of course, that was all the Lord's doing. We had nothing to do with it. He saw to that. But then the time came for her to be married. And that's another interesting story too, which I don't think I'll tell. However, the Lord saw to that too. You see, we had to leave our two girls in a rented house and uh, just leave them there and run. Some trouble was in Honduras, we had to get back. So we left them there on the road, <coughs> commending them to the Lord. But you know, the Lord looked after them in a wonderful way. Uh, sometimes I think better than if we had been with them. Yes, <coughs> and her eldest girl, met this young man, a Christian young man, and they were married in Ladera Gospel Chapel. I think it was Henry Peterson that officiated. And, uh, well, there was something extra, extra special about that wedding. Of course, I wasn't there. Uh, my wife was able to get up, I wasn't. So the children's house in Trujillo, we got twice the price that his father paid for it. That wasn't bad. Well, when you counted up the rent that they got from that, from ourselves, the uh, big room where the meetings were held was free. But then there was the other part of the house too. So when you counted all that up and then the interest they got in the money, well, there was enough to uh, get them a fairly good education. That's how it was done. We had nothing at all to do with it. It was the Lord's doings. And many wondered how it was done. Well, that's how it was done. It was the Lord that did it, opened up the way for it. 
And then, of course, when the time came for their marriages, they had that money too. That was theirs. It was not ours. Many times we could have used it, it's true. But when I was a little boy, I was taught that uh, I shouldn't tell lies and I shouldn't steal. And uh, my wife was taught the same thing. So we were uh, very, very careful not to take any of that money. That wasn't ours. That would be stealing. So it was all kept together. So eventually, when um, uh, Margaret got married and our brother Henry here officiated at that wedding and Ladera, well, there was a little bit of um, uh, mystery about it. How did the missionary's child get such a nice, Christian, wealthy boy? Well, <laughs> I wasn't there. It was the Lord. He had done it all. So then, uh, the marriage was uh, completed and all finished up. But it appears then afterwards that was, um, well, everyone was looking at the dresses, of course. But there was one particular dress, and that was my wife's dress. Now, there was a mystery about that dress. And uh, one dear sister said to another, I understand. Now, where, where would she get that dress? She must have gone to... Um, uh, to um, one of the big high stores like Robinson's and some of those to get a dress like that. I'm sure that dress went into the hundreds. Well, there they were having a nice friendly talk. I don't blame them. That's uh, generally the way the ladies do. Well, they can have that privilege. It's wonderful that they can indeed talk like that. However, it went on, and then another sister says, No, I can't see it. I don't understand it. There must be something about it. And the other sister says, No, that cost them into money. How in all the world can <coughs> missionaries afford that? Well, no. As it went on, the other sister said, Well, I'll go and ask the, uh, Nettie what it costs and all about it. Well, she came to Natty, and Natty said, well, you would like to know how much it cost. It cost under $10. Well, how did that come about? Well, it came about in this way. Well, they had to look for some wedding clothes, you know. That's very important, especially for lady folks. So, uh, she got a good chance of buying some, uh, uh, what do you call it in English, um, uh, cloth to make a dress. And it was a beautiful, beautiful piece of material. A very, very appropriate and very nice color. So my wife just started in and she made her own dress. So she hadn't to pay anyone to make it. Well, now, uh, as you know by this time, or if you don't, well, you ought to know that my wife excelled in many things. Uh, she excelled in nursery, in nursing. She excelled in cooking. And she taught many how to cook, whether it was for one or for 500 or 700, as uh, sometimes she had to do. And she taught them how to cook the rice without burning it <laughs> so that uh, uh, there wouldn't be so much cost for the conferences. And she taught them very many other things. And she taught them how to keep meat for a week without a refrigerator. <laughs>